Isn't it great to be back in the house of God? Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, so today we'll continue on with um, the focus, Holy Spirit. First of all, I'd like to thank God for giving me this, uh, His Word and enlightening me about the Holy Spirit Himself. Man, there is many more for us to discover. And i will also like to thank Pastor and also Jeremy for giving me this opportunity to be able to stand here to share the Word of God. Amen? So let us prepare our hearts and let us start with a prayer. But Father, we thank you that we can gather once again as elects, born of Jesus' baptism, death, and resurrection. And today, Father, I just want to commit myself into your loving hands, that you will use me mightily, that the Spirit of God will move in this place, that it's only by the power of the Holy Spirit that one can be safe. And Father, I also pray for the hearers uh, that is present here and also those who are listening online, Father, that your word will penetrate their hearts. And we know that your word is powerful. And Father, you just touch them and give them a new lift of life. That we know that your gospel truth is powerful and is able to do all things. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So today I've entitled my message as the temple of the living God. So if we see temple, right? In the Old Testament, if we read, there is also temple. And currently also we see other religions, there is also temple built. So the temple is a place, a holy, sacred place where men wants to meet God. They come, they ask for something, or they pray, okay? And the temple himself is where the presence of God dwell in the Old Testament, okay? So let us see in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 16 to 18, it says, What agreement can there be between a temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Even as God said, I will dwell in and with and among them and will walk in and with and among them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. So come out from among unbelievers and separate Severe yourself from them, says the Lord, and touch not any unclean thing. Then I will receive you kindly and treat you with favour. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Amen. God bless His word. So let us go back to verse 16. It says that we are the temple of the living God. That is why I've entitled my message as the temple of the living God. So in the Old Testament... God told Moses to build the tabernacle system, right? So that God can communicate with his people and his people can also communicate with God. But now in the New Testament, there is no more temple. God says that we, those who believe in Jesus' baptism, death and resurrection, is the temple of the living God. And why do I say so? Okay, let us go to my first point, which is accurate. So, In the Old Testament, the tabernacle system, when God told Moses how to build it and what they need to do, it is very accurate. There is a specific thing that God wants and how it should be built and done. Okay? And it is the same today. Our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has never changed the goalpost. So today as well, the gospel truth for us to be born again, to be able to meet God, to be able to have a relationship with God, there must be an accurate gospel, the gospel truth himself. Okay, so let us see in the Old Testament, how do we enter into the courtyard? From the courtyard, you need to enter through the gate of the courtyard, right? And thereafter, there is another gate to enter the holy place. And there is another veil to enter the holy of holies, which is the high priest only can enter. So, What is it made of? What is that specification that God told Moses? Okay, let us see in Exodus 27 verse 16, it says, For the gate of the court, there shall be a screen 20 cubits long, woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen, made by a waver. It shall have four pillars and four sockets. So, From the outside, if they want to go in, 
The senior needs to bring an unblemished animal, right? So when they want to go in, they will see this. Blue, purple, scarlet, and then is fine woven linen. Okay? Okay? Then after that, if you see from there, if you want to go in to the holy place, in Exodus 26 verse 36, it says, You shall make a screen for the door of the tabernacle woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen made by a waver. It's the same. Okay? And that veil in Exodus 26 verse 31 it says, You shall make a veil woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen. It shall be woven with an artistic design of the cherubim. So here we can see what that must there be. Blue, purple, scarlet, fine woven linen, and lastly, that veil has that cherubim design. So here it speaks about the accurate gospel now itself. How are we to be born again? How are we able to enter the Holy of Holies? It is only through Jesus' baptism, which is that blue, the purple, which is the spirit, the scarlet, which is Jesus' death, and the fine woven linen, which is pure. The Word of God is pure, flawless. So we must believe the written Word of God. And that cherubim means divine. So all of this is the will of God. It comes from God. The Word of God comes from God. This gospel truth is spoken in the Word of God. That is why Jesus' baptism, death and resurrection, which is written in 1 Job 5 verse 6 to 11, it says, This is He who came by with water and blood. His baptism and his death, the blue and the scarlet. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, not by in the water only, but by in the water and the blood. And it is the Holy Spirit who bears witness, the purple. Because the Holy Spirit is the truth. So there are three witnesses in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. So let's stop here first. We have discussed, right, the Holy Trinity. How are we to explain that three in one? And what is the proof? So here itself, it says that the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, the Word, means the Son as well, Jesus Christ, is the Word. They, these three are one. So here proves the Holy Trinity. And it says that we must come also, not only that the three witnesses in heaven, but next in verse 8, there are also three witnesses on earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree, are in unison, their testimony coincides. If we accept as we do the testimony of men, if we are willing to take human authority, the testimony of God is greater of stronger authority. For this is the testimony of God, even the witness which He has borne regarding His Son, he who believes in the Son of God, who adheres to, trusts, and relies on Him, has the testimony, possesses this divine attestation within himself. He who does not believe God in this way has made him out to be and represent him as a liar because he has not believed, put his faith in, adhere to, and rely on the evidence, the testimony that God has borne regarding his Son. And this is that testimony, the evidence. God gave us eternal life and this life is in His Son. Amen. So here it says, if we do not believe according to the Scripture, through Jesus' baptism, death and resurrection, the water and the blood and the Spirit who testifies, then He represents God as a liar. Okay? And the evidence is not within him. So the Holy Spirit cannot reside in that person if they do not believe according to the scripture. Not I, let's say, but the word of God that says it. And the evidence is God gave us that eternal life. So when we believe in Jesus' baptism, death and resurrection, we have the Holy Spirit residing in us. We have that eternal life. Because we believe that God sent His one and only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to take all our sins at River Jordan, to die for us, and after three days, resurrected. Okay? And thereafter, He sent the Holy Spirit, the promised Holy Spirit. Amen? 
And we can see also in the Old Testament, I think I shared this before as well, that when a sinner sinned, they need to come with an unblemished animal, right? Okay? To offer. But that is one person. What about the whole year? Some knowingly you sin, then you can bring back the unblemished animal, right? What if you do it unknowingly? So the yearly sacrifice where the high priest represents the whole nation to take away the sins of that nation. Okay? So that sacrificial system must be done. It must be done yearly. Okay? In the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, there is also a prototype. In the New Testament, John the Baptist, who is the last high priest. How do we know John the Baptist is the last high priest? We can see in Luke 16, verse 16 and 17, it says, The law and the prophet will proclaim until John. And since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached and everyone is forcing their way into it. It is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least stroke of a pen to drop out of the law. So why did I also quote verse 17? Because it says that it's easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least stroke of a pen to drop out of the law. Means whatever the law that God has given, the commandments that God has given last time in the Old Testament, all of it must be fulfilled. If you sin, you will die. And there is eternal judgment, damnation. There is the law. And nothing we can do to stop that. But through John the Baptist, who lay all our sins upon the body of Jesus Christ, that unblemished God, we are able when we believe and when we unite with Him. So at Jesus' baptism, UTC happened. Not our UTC, yeah? UTC means we are united with Christ. And what? We are united with Christ. Sin is transferred. Today, our conscience is clear because we know that all our sins have been transferred unto the body of Jesus Christ. Okay? And C, spiritual circumcision. We are also spiritually circumcised when we believe at Jesus' baptism. All of those. Today, because of that, when Christ died, we too have died. The, our self have died. I have died. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. That's why that verse can say that. And when Christ has resurrected, we too have resurrected and we have the resurrected Holy Spirit residing in us. Amen? And here it says that Jesus came to fulfill the law and by being the unblemished animal as our sin offering eternally, okay? So the animals that yearly sacrifice cannot satisfy God. But Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came down to satisfy God Himself, okay? And in John 1 verse 29, this is to prove that Jesus came as the unblemished lamb to take all our sins. So it says, the next day John saw Jesus coming to him and said, look, there is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Okay? And also in Matthew 3 verse 15 to 17, it proves that, it says that Jesus replied to John the Baptist, permit it just now, for this is fitting way for both of us, Jesus and John the Baptist, to fulfill all righteousness. That is to perform completely whatever is right, then he permitted him. And when Jesus was baptized, he went up at once, out of the water, and behold, the heavens were open, and he, John, saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, my beloved, in whom I delight. So today, if we believe in Jesus' baptism, death, and resurrection, the accurate gospel of how God has ordained from the beginning of time until now, until eternal eternity, then God says, you are my beloved son, whom I am well pleased. Not because of what we have done, or today I don't sin, or tomorrow I don't sin, but because Jesus Christ has fulfilled it all. Every drop of blood that he shed, he has washed you clean. 
as white as snow. And today, when Christ has resurrected, you too have that resurrected spirit in every single one who believes. Amen? Let us see in Hebrews 9 verse 11 to 14. But that appointed time came when Christ the Messiah appeared as a high priest of the better things that have come and are to come. Then through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with human hands, that is, not a part of this material creation. He went once for all into the holy of holies of heaven, not by virtue of the blood of goats and calves, but by which to make reconciliation between God and men, but his own blood, having found and secured a complete redemption and everlasting release for us. For if the mere sprinkling of unholy and defiled persons with blood of goats and bulls and with the ash of a burnt heifer is sufficient for the purification of the body, how much more surely shall the blood of Christ, who by virtue of his eternal spirit, his own pre-existent divine personality, has offered himself as an unblemished sacrifice to God, purify our conscience from dead works and lifeless observance to serve the ever-living God. Amen. So here it summarizes what I've said just now. God himself sent Christ, Jesus Christ himself, to take all of our sins once and for all. And by virtue of his blood, we have been cleansed once and for all. So that today, because Christ has went back to God, he says, right, I'm going back to the Father because it's more beneficial for everyone here so that He can send the promised Holy Spirit to reside in all of those who believe. Or else, Jesus can only be here at this moment, physically, and another place, at another time. But the Holy Spirit today can reside in every single one of us. Amen? So with that accurate gospel, it goes to my second point, a life. Now, the Spirit of God, that resurrected Spirit of God resides in us. That is the Holy Spirit that makes us alive today. It says, right, we are the temple of the living God. Our God is not dead. Our God is a living God. That is why you are also alive in the Spirit today. Okay? And in Ephesians 2 verse 5, it says, Even when we were dead, slain by our own shortcomings and trespasses, He made us alive together in fellowship, in union with Christ. He gave us the very life of Christ Himself. The same new life with which He quickened Him for, it is by grace, His favour, mercy, which you did not deserve, that you are safe, delivered from judgment and made partakers of Christ's salvation. So here it says, even when we were dead by our own shortcoming and trespasses, He has made us alive. It means God has predestined all of this. So what makes us now to think that, oh, I need to be this to be qualified for the gospel. I need to be that. I need to be the tip-top person to be able to receive the Holy Spirit. Because even in our shortcoming, our trespasses, in our weakness, God has already predestined. And those who believe in Jesus' baptism, death and resurrection, you are made alive together in fellowship, in union with Christ. Amen? And in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 12, it says, Now we have not received the Spirit that belongs to the world, but the Holy Spirit who is from God given to us that we might realize and comprehend and appreciate the gifts of divine favour and blessing so freely and lavishly bestowed on us by God. So here, when we are alive, I want to make a point here. It says, the Holy Spirit is given from God. So if you acknowledge that you believe in Jesus' baptism, death and resurrection, that resurrected Spirit, the Holy Spirit resides in you, and that is from God. Because the Word of God, we know, right? is divine, the will of God. And then the Spirit that is given to us is also divine. It is also the will of God. Then we, those who believe, must realize, comprehend and appreciate that gift. That means we must be always aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit residing in us. 
Today, we are that temple. The Spirit of God. So you are the connection for man and God. Because we said, right, just now when I started, the temple is for those men that wants to come and meet God. So we today, who have the Holy Spirit, we are that temple. We are that connector, that bridge. And it's only, we know that it's only through Jesus' baptism, death and resurrection, the gospel itself, that one can have the Holy Spirit resides, have the forgiveness of sin, the release of sin. Then we too must share this gospel out as well. So realizing, comprehending and appreciating the gifts, whatever divine favour and blessing that God has given us so freely, we must use it for His glory. And why do I say that we must be aware of the Holy Spirit? Because when we are aware that the Spirit of God now resides in us, then we won't live our life recklessly as the temple of God. Okay? So, in John 14, verse 16 to 17, it says, And I will pray the Father, and He will give you another helper, which is the Holy Spirit, that He may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So today, when we are aware of the Holy Spirit, we know that he dwells in us, but we also must be aware that he dwells with us, among us, and whatever that we pray, whatever that we surrender unto God, he is the one that is moving it. We must acknowledge being aware of the Spirit means fearing God. Acknowledging God in everything that you do. No matter your high, your low, you are acknowledging God. Acknowledging that God is you, the Spirit of God that is guiding me, leading me through this path. And we must also be respectful to the Spirit that is residing in us. As what Brother Jeremy has shared, right? The Holy Spirit is a person itself. And how we treat and respect our parents, the people around us. What more God that is residing in us. Okay? And in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16, it says, Do you not discern and understand that you, the whole church of Corinth, are God's temple, His sanctuary, and that God's Spirit has His permanent dwelling in you, to be at home in you collectively as a church and also individually. So, it comes back again, the awareness. Because Paul says, do you not discern, don't you know, that the Spirit resides in you? You are God's temple. You are the temple of that living God. And the Spirit of God, if your belief is correct, which is baptism, death, and resurrection. God's Spirit is permanently dwelling in you. And to be at home in you, collectively as a church and also individually. So here it emphasizes that individually you have the Spirit, the Holy Spirit residing in you. As a church as well, we are also a temple of the living God. Amen? And here it says, God's Spirit has His permanent dwelling in you, right? But with God's Spirit dwelling in you, as the Holy Spirit is also a person, we might or sometimes grieve the Holy Spirit as well. Okay? Let us see in Ephesians 4 verse 30, it says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do not offend or vex or sadden Him, by whom you were still marked, branded as God's own secured for the day of redemption, of final deliverance through Christ from evil and the consequences of sin. So I give a simple illustration. For example, you know that Sister Ern will bring you through this whole journey. You stay at her place for free. She will provide you three meals, maybe with supper and also with everything. And lavish you whatever you want to buy, she will give you. Then how will you treat her? Will you treat her like, yeah, you was nothing also lah. This is, you need to give me. Or will you treat her very nicely so that she can buy more things for you? We will treat her nicer, right? We're like, hey, 
Then I want her to fetch me here, fetch me there, so she will drive. Okay, so I'll treat her better. With more respect, with more, whatever she wants also, I can, can, can. That's how we treat the person that will do so much for us, right? What more the Holy Spirit residing in us? It says here, do not grieve the Holy Spirit, do not offend or vex or sadden Him, whom you were sealed with. The Holy Spirit is the one that you were sealed with for the day of redemption. The Spirit in you is the one that will bring you back to God. If you want to go back to heaven, the Spirit in you is that sealed. So we must treat that Spirit with respect, like how we would treat someone that has given us so much. But the Spirit of God will give us so much more than the physical, the material things that we have now. The Spirit of God can give us insight. The Spirit of God is, the, uh, is our help, our counsellor, our advocator. In time of need, He is there. Amen? So, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. If you read the whole chapter of Ephesians 4, it says, how are we to grieve the Holy Spirit? When, when they are cause jesting, all of those things that we, are, that we will do in the flesh. Because in the Spirit, the Spirit of God do not lie. The Spirit of God is holy, pure. But only in the flesh we will do all those. So when we walk in the flesh, we are indirectly grieving the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is wanting you to come back to Him, to walk in the Spirit again. Okay? And one thing, grieving the Holy Spirit, another thing that the Bible also says about is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. So let us see, in Mark 3, verse 28 to 30, it says, Truly I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes again the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. The he here is Jesus Christ. So how do we blaspheme against the Holy Spirit? And this is what I've been thinking and thinking and thinking and praying to God. What does it mean by blaspheming against the Holy Spirit? And he says here in verse 30, he says, because the Pharisee says that Jesus Christ has an impure spirit, meaning that the Pharisees do not believe. There is unbelief in them. Not acknowledging that Jesus Christ is the Son of God came to this world to take all our sins, die for us and resurrect to the newness of life so that today we can have the Holy Spirit. So that unbelief itself caused them to, be, to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. It means you are going against the work of the Holy Spirit Himself and they will never be forgiven because we know that only when we believe in Jesus' baptism, death and resurrection, we are forgiven. Release of sin, and we have the gift of that Holy Spirit. Amen? And we see that in John 16, verse 8 to 11, it says that what is the work of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit came to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So if we say that we're going against the work of the Holy Spirit, we're going against the work of the Holy Spirit in convicting the world of sin, righteousness and judgment. So it will happen in our lives as well. Sin is basically what I said just now. Unbelief, right? Those who do not believe in the Word of God, then they cannot be forgiven. But righteousness, the Holy Spirit convicts the born-again believers of righteousness, right? So that when we walk in sin, when we are weak, when we fail, when we walk in the flesh, the Holy Spirit can guide us back to walk in the Spirit. So, how do we blaspheme the Holy Spirit when we are walking as a born again, okay? So, when we are walking in the flesh, immediately we must be renewed in our minds that we know that Jesus has taken all my sins, died for me, resurrected, today I have the Spirit in me, and that Spirit is the one that is guiding me, and today I'm sinless and righteous, right? But when we blaspheme the Holy Spirit, meaning that when you walk in the flesh, the deeper the sin, the harder for you to get out, right? Then you think that, oh, maybe, maybe the Word of God is not that true. Maybe 
that sin that I did last year was forgiven. But today, this is too hard. God cannot unsee that sin. Then you are blaspheming the Holy Spirit because there is unbelief in you. And you're going back and walking back in the flesh again. Okay? So, just now we have gone through the grieving of the Holy Spirit and now it's blaspheming the Holy Spirit, right? So, how do we avoid all of this? It's by walking in the Spirit itself. So, as a born-again elect who is alive, we need to activate all of this, the gift of the Holy Spirit in our life. So, my third point is activate. So just now, our source text was 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16 to 18, right? So it says that we are the temple of the living God, that God dwells in and with, and God walks with and in. And in verse 17 to 18, it also says that we must separate ourselves out to be set apart, okay? So activate is simply by walking in the Spirit. When we know that we walk in the flesh, we need to activate our minds, renew our minds, and walk back into the Spirit. Okay? So in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16 to 18, it says that, And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And in verse 17, it says, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. So basically means that there must be a division. We must know when we are aware of the spirit that is working in and through us, then we are able to divide. We have that division line. I'm walking the flesh now. I need to walk back into the spirit. The spirit of God is yearning and wanting me to come back. again. Okay? And how do we, when we walk in the flesh, when the flesh rises, how do we walk back into the spirit? Okay? So I have three S for you. Okay? First is stop. When we walk in the flesh, for me, I'm highly like agitated or when fear sets in, when uncertainty sets in, then I'll get you know, haywire all over. Or when things go unexpected, or when there's too much piling at you, your assignments or work, then stop. Stop is the first one. The second one is C. Look to God. When you stop and you look to God, the third one is surrender. When you look to God means you're praying and you're surrendering to God. It says, God, I cannot do anything in this situation. Maybe physically, I'm able to do this and that, but I've tried and it doesn't work. Nothing is coming to friction. There is no result. But I know that I'm surrendering it to you and you know the best for me. Surrender and let the Spirit of God lead you to do the next step. And it is a living testimony. I am that living testimony that God has seen. He is faithful. Yesterday, today, and forever, He is the same, right? He is also faithful yesterday, today, and forever. And He will see you through. And when He sees His children being agitated, sad, when you surrender it to God, He will bring it into friction. Amen? And we must trust in Him as well. Okay? So three S. Stop, see, and surrender. And you will see God's work in your life. Amen? And also in activate, we must also activate the gift of the Holy Spirit in us. And what did the Holy Spirit came and do? I think Pastor has shared many of it, right, in the Bible study previously. So first, He is our comforter. In Psalms 34 verse 18, it says, The Lord is close to those who are of a broken heart and saves such as are crushed with sorrow for sin and are humble entirely penitent. And in Psalms 118 verse 5, it says that out of my distress, I call upon the Lord. And the Lord answered me and set me free and in a large place. So the psalmist know who is God is. And we must also know that the Spirit in us is our comforter. 
Like I said just now, right? When you're in anxiety, when you're in distress, the Spirit in you can only give you that peace. Even though there is storms around you, things are not changing, but you have that peace. Knowing that God will see you through. Amen? And He is also our counsellor, our advocate in John 14 verse 26 to 27. It says, But the comforter, counsellor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, standby. So all of these words are not just mere words in the Bible, but it must be a rhema to every single one of us. He will counsel us in times of need, in times of decision-making. He is our counsellor. He is our helper. When we are helpless, He's our helper. He will intercede for us as well. When we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit Himself is the intercessor. He's our advocate, our strengthener. When you're so weak and you have no mood, you have no life in us, the Spirit of God is that life that will bring you back to a state where we know that we are a child of God. We are more than a conqueror in Christ, okay? And He's a standby here. And the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, in my place to represent me and act on my behalf, He, the Spirit Himself, will teach you all things and He will cause you to recall, will remind you of, bring you to remembrance everything I have told you. Peace I leave with you, my own peace I now give and bequeath to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Stop allowing yourself to be agitated, disturbed, and do not permit yourself to be fearful and intimidated and cowardly and unsettled. Amen. God bless His Word. And the Holy Spirit also reminds us of the Word of God. He says, right, He will teach us what to say. Meaning that all the time that you spend in church, that is why the gathering of saints is important. Because in the gathering of saints, we are hearing the Word of God. We are listening to the Word of God. And the Spirit of God in you is receiving, receiving, receiving. And when in time of need, when you're helpless, when you're weak, the Spirit of God Himself will give you that Word to encourage you, to uplift you as well. Okay? And in Romans 8 verse 1 to 2, it says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation no judging guilt of wrong for those who are in Christ Jesus, who live and walk not after the dictates of the flesh, but after the dictates of the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus, the law of our new being, has freed me from the law of sin and death. Amen. So, this is the Word of God. It says that today we have no condemnation for those who of Christ Jesus who walks in the Spirit. So when we walk in the Spirit, we know that we are no longer condemned because Christ was condemned on our behalf. And then it says the Spirit of, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has freed us from the law of sin and death. Sin, the penalty is death. But today when we walk in the Spirit, there is life and peace. Amen? And Next is, uh, the Holy Spirit is also our, in, will intercede for us, like I've said just now, in Romans 8 verse 26. It says, so too the Holy Spirit comes to our aid and bears us up in our weakness. For we do not know what prayer to offer, nor how to offer it worthily as we ought. But the Spirit Himself goes to meet our supplication and pleads in our behalf with unspeakable yearnings and groanings too deep for our trance. Okay? And also... The Spirit of God gives us gift. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4 to 11, it says there is a diversity of gift that the Spirit of God gives. But it's the same Spirit that gives all of those gifts. Maybe some in the preaching of the Word of God, the proclamation of the Word of God in teaching. All of those, they are gift given to every single one of us. But it's that same Spirit, one Spirit that gives all of us those gifts. And we must activate the gift so that we can encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ and also be a mediator 
You are that mediator between the world and God. Amen? And last but not least is the Spirit of God. When we walk in the Spirit of God, it gives health to our mortal, short-lived, perishable body. In Romans 8 verse 11. And why must we activate that as well? Because we need to have a healthy body to serve the righteousness of God. Without this body, I can't be standing here. So we must have the Spirit of God to prompt us every single day to walk in the Spirit so that we are able to be made alive, activated because of this accurate gospel that we have. Amen? So to sum up, is that three points, okay? Accurate which is Jesus' baptism, death, and resurrection. It's from the Word of God. It is the will of God. That sanctification is the will of God. It's only true, Jesus' baptism, death, and resurrection. Blue, purple, scarlet, intertwined with white linen. Okay? And alive. We and the gathering of saints are God's temple. We are the temple of the living God. And activate. Exercise your authority and power. In the Spirit, you have all authority and power has been given to you. In Matthew, Jesus said, right? All authority and power has been given to you. So go and preach this gospel truth so that all men will be able to go back to their maker. Amen? Thank you. 